I saw that the work cannot last even an hour more. Our fight is for our survival and for our right to be diverse. He will stop where we will be able to stop him. So, good afternoon. Um, very happy to see such a turnout. We are here together for um, the exhibition, This is Ukraine Defending Freedom. My name is Bjorn Geldof. I am the artistic director of the Pinchuk Art Center and the curator of the exhibition. With me are um, the artists, and I'm very proud to sit among them. I'll start from my right-hand side, Nikita Kadan, uh, Evgenia Belarusets, Lesha Khomenko, and GR. Um, up until the 23rd of February, we all thought that we would show here in this magnificent building of the Misericordia, the Future Generation Art Prize. On the 24th of February, our reality changed, our world changed. And making a celebration, which the Future Generation Art Prize has always been, became completely impossible, even though we love and we are incredibly committed to all these artists, we understood we can no longer do this. And for a short time, I think it was impossible for us to imagine to do anything. When your country is under attack, making art or showing art is for sure not one of the priorities. But exactly four weeks ago, to the day, our founder, Viktor Pinchuk, he took the initiative and he decided to create, with the full support of the Ukrainian president, President Zelensky, and the Ministry of Culture, and in partnership with them, a project that we see here today, with the goal to really, in the strongest possible sense, show Ukrainian culture, not just in a contemporary way, but really culture in a deep historical way. And for this project, the president offered us in his own handwriting what became the key image of the exhibition. He wrote on the flag, we are defending our freedom. And this is exactly what this exhibition is about, defending freedom. And when you defend freedom, you don't only do that through arms. You have to do this on all different fronts, including the artistic front. And when I speak about defending freedom, I don't mean that in a political or a, or a physical sense. Defending freedom is freedom to think. It is defending the freedom to reflect. It's defending the freedom to exist. And in that sense, what they have done is about survival. What this exhibition is about is about survival. Because Ukraine survives not only through soldiers, Ukraine survives through artists and all those who do their job, who create their work, and who continue in the most difficult circumstances to think, to reflect, and to be critical. So this is a joint force project between the government, Pinchukat Center, the artists, everybody involved, because we couldn't have pulled that off without incredible support. It's a project that goes beyond direct narratives or war narratives, but really looks in a deeper, um, in a critical way, on the deeper meaning, impact, and origin of war. And the exhibition itself has two chapters. We are sitting in the second, but downstairs is the first chapter, the ground floor, where we have Ukrainian artists speaking about Ukraine. This is Ukraine about Ukraine. We have Yevgenia Belarusets, who's sitting next to me, Lesha, Khomenko, sitting next to me, and Nikita Kadan, who each created new work, um, with exception for Yevgenia, all of them created it in I think one or two weeks, Evgenia was writing for 40 days. And while they were in Ukraine, which I think is very important to understand, 
Additionally, if you want to show Ukraine and you want to speak about Ukraine in a deeper historical sense, we also needed to show what that history was. So with the support of the President's Office and the Ministry of Culture, we succeeded to evacuate four beautiful treasures of Ukrainian heritage. They are here thanks to M9, our partner who has delivered our all the support to make sure that we could receive them here in Ukraine. And even though these four works are only a small fraction of the treasures that are under threat, they speak for all Ukraine. And on the second floor where we are here, this is something different. This is about an international Ukraine. This is about an open Ukraine. It's about a Ukraine that has real friends who respond to the urgent need to rally for a long term around the country. And in this chapter, we have the work that, you know, we're sitting next to Takashi Murakami, War and Peace, a work that he made in 2018 as a response to the war in Donbass. Because we can't forget that the war we're talking about is not a new war, something that started in 2014, that continued till today. We have also the work of Olaf Eliasson, Madrina Abramovic, Damien Hurst, who responded in an incredible way when Viktor Pinchuk, our founder, he was very engaged, called and said, let's do this, let's, let's make something together. Damien immediately responded by making a completely new painting that completely, you know, almost wet arrived here, and you can see behind. And our Ukrainian hero, Boris Mikhailov, who is, of course, also a very important voice to keep here in the exhibition. Last and not least, I didn't forget you. <laughs> GR, who went to Ukraine, who actually made an incredible project there supporting Ukraine, supporting Ukrainians, and we will hear from him later. But what I want to talk about here on the second floor as well is them. We can see them on the right hand side, on my right hand side, your left hand side. Um, it's 300 portraits of mothers. These are portraits of mothers who have lost their son in the first part of the war, 2014, 2015, in Donbass. It's just portraits of survivors. And under it, you can each time read their name, the name of their son, the age of their son when he died, and how they called their son in private. And the reason to have that work there is because when we talk about war, we think about war, it becomes something abstract. We start talking about statistics and numbers. But after every person, every number is one. Every one is a boy or a child or a mother or a father. And we shouldn't forget that. We should not forget that when we see what is happening in Ukraine. So, in this case, I, I think I, I spoke enough. <laughs> and I would like to give the word um, to my Ukrainian friends. And first, Evgenia, you sit next to me on the right-hand side. Perhaps I will ask you and I'll ask everybody the same question. So, you just pass on the mic. Say shortly what, what is important about your work and, and perhaps what is important about this exhibition. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bjorn, uh, and thank you for everybody for being here. I understand coming to this press conference is also a gesture of solidarity. Writing about this exhibition today is not also writing about art itself, but also showing solidarity and thinking together with our society about what is happening right now. When Bjorn invited me to participate in this exhibition, I heard about the works of Nikita and Lesia. Uh, they, this work, works should be shown together with my work on the same floor. And immediately I felt a deep connection between all these works. These works were witnessing the biographies of the artists. These works were, could be understood also as a pure document of the time, something that tries to, to use uh, artistic method 
not only to reflect, but also to witness the reality we are facing. And I think my work is exactly the same. It is a diary which I started on the 24th of February. When the war started, I, I only tried to write. I wrote uh, my first diary. Uh, when you will see it, it starts with the tables far away from each other. And the second day is also on two tables. And every day should be uh, represented on one table. Uh, because I thought that the work cannot last even an hour more. I, I couldn't imagine it would last several days at the first day of the war. I, I was thinking that every minute, every hour of this war is too much. The earth, the world, the society, international society, global society would not be able to live with it one minute more and it would be developed some way to stop it. And this idea, this strong feeling that actually something is happening that should be stopped every minute gave me the power to write every day, actually uh, 39 days uh, long. And uh, my work is an attempt uh, not to forget what was happening. Actually, me, not only me, but others who stayed in the war zone, they um, showed uh, strong loses of memory. You, you, you have a conversation with somebody in Mariupol and uh, you feel a lot, but you forget details very quickly. And the next day you cannot remember what this person said to you, even so you were thinking that this may be our most important words that you have heard during a long, long period of time. So this diary that I was writing for a German magazine uh, helped me not to forget. And photography, I was also doing every day a small photography series, maybe from one bis, uh, to, to ten photographs per day. And uh, this work also helped me not to forget. So I think my, my work is about memory and... Um, yeah, that's, that's it, and... Thank you, Evgenia. I'll pass on the word to Nikita. Nikita, please. Thank you, Bjorn. Yeah, uh, my work uh, in this exhibition contains material evidences. Uh, one of pieces of iron uh, present in uh, this installation uh, was taken uh, from the devastated area of uh, Lukyanovska metro station in a three minutes walk from my house. Actually, when a uh, Russian uh, missile uh, hit the building of uh, Artyoma factory, um, I was sleeping, I didn't hear the explosion, but it was heard like uh, through all the city center. Uh, and uh, then, at noon, I walked there and I picked uh, one uh, piece of iron destroyed by shrapnel and walked with it to an art gallery in uh, underground space which was a bomb shelter in Soviet time during Cold War. I picked this piece of iron there. Then, in a few weeks, I traveled with it to the west of Ukraine, uh, to the city of Ivano-Frankivsk, where I worked on residence for internally displaced artists, like initiated by Olesya Homenko. Uh, and um, uh, what next? I traveled with it to Romania through pedestrian pass, uh, then from the city of Yashi, bringing as uh, a box with a piece of iron in my hands, I uh, took a plane uh, to Venice. So I feel myself like a bit connected uh, with this piece of iron. And uh, actually, uh, the poetics of the work is a poetics of material evidence. And material evidence is connected with archive, with memory, and with uh, images and narratives of so-called common past, the Soviet uh, period, and especially with a narrative like this special Soviet narrative about uh, World War II, which is actively used in Russian propaganda to justify 
this aggression and, in fact, the new genocide of Ukrainians. So uh, now our presence transforms our past. Like the narrative changes and we should keep this transformation of historical narrative transparent to liberate it from the ideologically controlled propagandist use. So there are evidences and archives. In fact, war from today and uh, these highly, let's say, symbolized images of the war from the past. And uh, regarding the exhibition, for me it's a great honor and pleasure exhibit uh, together with Evgenia and Lesa and also to be exhibited nearby uh, great works of Maria Primachenka or Boris Mikhailov and uh, works of international like superstars I consider like politically important gestures of support of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Nikita. So, Lesha, you have the last, la not the full last word, but... Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for everyone. Uh, my works on this exhibition is uh, large-scale paintings uh, downstairs. I start this work in Ivano-Frankivsk. Uh, we evacuated with family there from Kiev on 25th of February, and we found uh, local art residency uh, to support rep uh, replaced artists like me, and we provide their laboratory to think how art could react on a recent moment and survive in this turbulence time, and did different things. And this painting is uh, depicted my husband, Max Robotov, uh, who now in the army, in the territory defense, and he's an artist and musician. And I was curious how he has changed there, or how, what does he do there? And it's, uh, every, it's very much about curiosity and uh, about private attitude, personal attitude to the war through my husband. And um, uh, he sent me a few images, and I'm working with images of soldiers for a long time now, like about five years. And uh, since 24th of February, uh, we have another laws, uh, another regulation that it's forbidden uh, to shoot uh, uh, military objects on uh, soldiers because it could be used by Russians to uh, shelling, for shelling or for shooting. So images now turn not only f as a tool of the informational war, but they turn to the gun. And for me, the role of the sharing photos is very important. And every uh, gesture in this digital photo, like blurring or hiding something, or for example, illuminating something very strongly, is very important. And I think that the war also very connected with uh, telephones, that everyone has telephone, and the evidence, we are like, it's like evidence, and we uh, are looking on the fo photos of the dead bodies every day. And uh, this sharing photo is also very connected to my husband's situation, because he can't make photo in the army, but when we are talking online, he n uh, never switch on camera, for example. So it's about missing him, and uh, about... Uh, using this material as a sharing photo. And at the same time, uh, the images are very, uh, have very double uh, identity because uh, the guys are in a casual outfit because first days they didn't have uniforms. And I was guessing what the details lead me to the idea that they are soldiers now. So uh, everyone has a professional, like a chemist, a lawyer, or. IT engineer, for example, or musician as my husband. So it's very much about the war and uh, represents our society, like everyone is involved, involved in the war, everyone's struggling in a different levels. Thank you, Leisha. Now, GR, I actually have for you the question, why did you need to go to Ukraine? What did it mean for you to be there and, and, um, and to make the work that you did? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I speak as a 
you know, as a French citizen who is just at home following like everyone else here, what's happening in the media of Ukraine. I had never been there before. And uh, every day I would follow the news and you feel that you don't know what you can do. And as an artist, even doing the kind of work I do, I felt maybe my art is not needed here. And I started receiving a lot of DM message on Instagram from Ukrainian artists. And at some point, one of them said, why don't you post more about this? And I said, well, I would love, tell me what to post, I'll share it. And I think that sparkled something. And I said, well, send me one of your drawings, I'll post it. He says, oh, I actually, I don't have one about this, you, you should repost the news. And I said, I want to do something more about that. And then he connected me with other people. I started speaking with them. All this happened in 24 hours. And then one of them was at the border because he have a French passport. And I say, what are you seeing? He said, well, you know, the men stay here to defend the country. It's only women and children. I mean, here there's tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands. I said, well, send me photos. And uh, in these photos that he sent me, there's this little girl, Valeria, that you see right here. Uh, that's on the other side of that box who's five years old, he sent me that photo, and I, I call him right away and I say, go ask her mom if she'd be okay if I use that photo. So he goes and asks the mom and says, there's this artist called Jair, he enlarged photos, would you be okay with that? Let me explain you very clearly what it could be. And she said, yes, if that can speak for all the children that are fleeing right now, my five years old is alive and safe, thanks God, but my family is still in Ukraine. I printed it in four days at the size of 45 meter, then with a group of other friends who from friends wanted to go, we drove there because it's the first time ever in my life that there's a wall that it's so close that you can actually drive there. And then we crossed the border to Ukraine and through Instagram I met a lot of other people. They came with their car and they met us there and we loaded the giant banner in their car and we drove to Lviv. When we got there, uh, they told me, look, uh, we are enlarging a photo because the idea of this photo is that the planes from Russia would see who they're bombarding. But it's so big that it's driving so much attention that we have to be very careful where we're doing it. So we had to be in touch with the army there to make sure they approve such a thing. And I was very surprised because I told them, are you sure art is needed here in this way? I don't want to interfere with anything. And I say, you don't understand, not only is it needed, but you're going to see hundreds of people helping today because it's meaningful that the world see in another way, maybe that, you know, what is happening. And when we arrived in some of the squares, there was nobody. So I was like, well, but how are the people are going to come? They said, don't worry, we told them an exact time. I was like, well, this exact time is actually in five minutes. How is hundreds of people are going to show up? And I could not believe in five minutes later, there was a hundred people that arrived. And then we walked through the city, all the way to the main square of Elviv, in front of the Opera House, where hundreds of more people, you can see it on the photo that's over there, started carrying this little girl. Then after that, that image made it to the cover of Time magazine and spread out. And I was like, wait, when I crossed the, the border going back to Poland, I was with the hundreds of thousands of refugees that were fleeing. And by staying there with everybody, with little kids, literally waiting in the cold, all, you know, like it shocked me. I have never seen, I've been in many places, remember, I have never seen something like that. And I was like, what else can we do? As, just as a regular citizen, what else can we do? So when I made it back on the other side and, uh, and shared the image, um, I came back again in Ukraine the following week. Uh, and for two, three days, I would go back every day and meet again with the people and say, what else can we do with this? And I decided that this image should be sold as an NFT so that people could see how transparent we're spending this money and that every single penny in would go out, but we would use it directly on the ground. And so since then, every week we're sending trucks filled with foods and needs that the people have asked, and we've sent one, another one arrived today in, in Ukraine. But I've never done that before. I don't even know how to do it. I've just made a call online and say, hey guys, we want to do this. We actually found the money to do it. Now we find the goods to send. Who knows how to drive a truck in Ukraine? Lots of people in Poland started replying and say, well, you know what? We're truck drivers. We drive in Ukraine every day. We'll do it. You want to deliver to Kiev? You want to deliver to any city? We'll do it because we're very close with the Ukrainian people. And this is what we've been doing the last 30 years. And so I, you know, it's, it's, it made me realize how important art is even in the situation. The last thing I'll say is when I went back there and I was like, what kind of food can I send? What? They said, JR, it's not food we need necessarily in all the places. You have to understand that 
sometimes even in the country so big that some of us that are not impacted by the war forgot about the war. So imagine in your country. Right now it's in the top of your news. But you say, just give it another week or two or three or four, and maybe it will be just another title at the bottom of the news. So this right now, where we are right here, is very important. Because, you know, someone asked me right before, what do you think is the, the art can change for that? Should we gather? And it's being there and hearing the people telling me, oh my God, make that little girl travel. So before it's actually exhibited here, it travels through each city we would drive to, we'd open it. We'd ask, like in the city of Venice, uh, it was open last week uh, on the main square. It was open in Paris. It was open in Dusseldorf, in Berlin. And after this exhibition, it would keep traveling. Hopefully by then the war will be over and it will not need to travel. But that's where you realize that art have this strong uh, force and, and can gather thousands and hundreds of people that not necessarily don't know how to, they can help. Thank you, GR, not only for helping, but for inspiring. I think that's very important too. So I, I would like to now really also not only thank the artist, but the people who made this happen. I mean, first of all, there's obviously the president's office and the president himself, whom without this, we wouldn't be sitting. And there's the Ministry of Culture, who together with the National Museum in Lviv and the National Museum of Art in Kiev, made it possible that the treasures are here. And of course, Luca, please join us. I would like you just also to have the chance to say something. Come on. Um, Luca is the director of M9, and, and M9 gave us everything we needed to, to make the treasures come here, which is not easy, so Luca, please. Thank you so much, I really feel honored to be here. M9 is a very young museum, it's based in Mestre, and it's devoted to the history of the 20th century. Uh, so, sorry, so it's a century of wars and peace uh, and freedom, and so when uh, they ask us to, to provide the help to bring, uh, as an institution, Italian institution, the artworks from Ukraine to Venice, we'll be super proud and happy. It's the same question, what should we do for this war? No? So this is what we do. We, we, we provide help to make it possible. And we are really very honored because it's the way to defend freedom. It's also a way to work on uh, formalities, to work on processes, and to have the possibilities to have those artworks here to celebrate a country which is needed to be defended. And its cultural heritage is the idea of the, its identity, you know, which must be kept and uh, produced for the next generation. So we are very honored, and uh, M9 is uh, very, happy, uh, very happy to be collaborative with, uh, with your beautiful project. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. So last but not least, I would like to thank the people who made it possible. And I, I just have to name a few because otherwise, you know, I find it unfair. There's, there's my team, um, team of Pinchuk Art Center who worked day and night to make this happen, very often from Ukraine, from very difficult circumstances, from working from basements back to apartments, back to basements. And most of them made it here, so I'm incredibly happy to have them. They're real heroes. Thank you very much to all of them. And of course, we have to speak about Alessandro Borgomainerio and his team who made this also possible, who jumped to the occasion together with VD Square to put this all up. And of course, the team of Misericordia, thank you very much. You made it possible. As some of you might know or not know, we have some more surprises for you. And um, thank you to, to everybody here. We will now move on to a um, little bit of a debate or, or a discussion session. Um, we have the honor to have President Kwasniewski here, um, who, will, who will lead the debate. And first, however, we have from the First Lady from Ukraine, the wife of the President, we have received a letter and we have received some images. She couldn't speak herself. Um, she couldn't be filmed just because of security concerns. Her life is every day under threat and uh, she's completely targeted by the Russians. So she still wanted to share because I believe that what we will hear is an emotional appeal for things that she feels are incredibly important for her country. 
and I would like to invite Ambassador Melnik, um, Ambassador, Ukrainian Ambassador to Ukraine, to, um, excuse me, I'll start again, Ambassador, um, Ambassador of Ukraine to Italy, to join us here and to perhaps say or read uh, the letter of uh, the First Lady. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. It is a very strange feeling to talk about art here and this eternal city museum at the opening of the world's greatest cultural salon, La Biennale di Venezia. Under this calm sky, which has seen all the great artists of Europe, it's hard to believe in the existence of war, rocket, fire, and air bombs. Meanwhile, it is the 57th day of the war in Ukraine today. The most devastating and bloody war in Europe since the Second World War, which has already taken 205 children and thousands of adult lives. The art is an island in chaos. It's also a kind of confrontation and resistance where life says stop to death. You will not go farther. That is why we are glad that Ukraine, its life, its soul, are here now. And they can talk to the world about their pain through an art. However, since Soviet times, Ukraine has not had its own pavilion in Venice. But we believe it will, it will appear soon. Otherwise, it cannot be. As you hear these words, you see footage that also resembles an installation. But this is not an installation. Yes, sandbags cover monuments in Ukrainian cities. This is what the monuments to the founders of Kyiv and Odessa, the monuments to our poets and composers look like today. Just park sculptures. In Dnipro, we had to protect in this way even the ancient stone sculptures, the so-called Scythian women. They have survived hundreds of wars, and we want them to survive this one. To be seen, to be seen by our children, our grandchildren, and the whole world, because they are for life, not for death. These are the installations that the war is creating now. Every day, every minute, all of our museums, all of our architecture, every painting is under threat. Just like every Ukrainian. It's hard to say, but art is mortal, like everyone else. You understand this, especially during the war with the enemy, who is indifferent to both people and art. This is a ruined Chernihiv Museum of Antiquities. It survived the Second World War, but did not survive the invasion of the Russians. We felt such pain, as if for a living person, when in the first days of the war, the Russians bombed the museum of the folk naive artist Maria Primachenko. For each of us, her paintings are an incarnate fairy tale from our childhood. And in front of us at that moment, it was as if a fairy tale was shot. But the fairy tale survived. After the liberation of Kiev region, we found out that a museum security guard and his wife had saved everything under fire. It would be a shame if it burned down and we could do nothing, these brave people said. It's a miracle of art and humanity, which is especially impressive among the horrors of war. And this is a story of hope and victory, because art is the victory of hope. 
and we in Ukraine live with this hope. So let there be art, and Ukraine will definitely win. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, and thank you for the First Lady who wrote such an emotional letter. Um, may I invite President Kwasniewski to the stage, who will now lead the debate that we foresaw. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I want to invite the panelists on the stage because we want to discuss about defending freedom, this sentence what is on the uh, uh, signed by President Zawenski, what we've seen on the posters. And uh, I would like to invite Professor Plochi, Anastasia Gule, she is coming, uh, Evgenia Belorusets, Mikita Kadan. Kadan. So, now we can start. Uh, Dear friends, uh, thank you very much for your presence. Uh, I think time is very special, historical, and uh, this uh, Biennale is a part of this historical time, or historical period in, in, in the world. I'm very much honored that uh, I was invited to moderate this uh, discussion before the official opening of um, Ukraine Pavilion. Uh, please uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Alexander Kwasniewski. I was the president of Poland in the years 95-2005. Uh, I was very much involved uh, in Ukrainian issues from the uh, beginning of Ukrainian independence, 91. Uh, today I'm chairman of Yalta European Strategy uh, Organization, uh, which is very much active and this uh, way to um, uh, uh, accelerate Ukrainian membership in European Union. Uh, uh, I was one of the leading person during Orange Revolution as a president of Poland uh, to find a compromise. Then I was special envoy of uh, European Parliament 2012-13 to release political prisoners in Ukraine. So I'm, I'm very much, let's say, Ukrainian. <laughs> and uh, everything will happen last uh, days. That, that, that is not. That is, of course, a tragedy for for Ukraine, for for, for Europe and the world. And but it's also very much personal tragedy for me. And I'm very much honored because in our panel we will have a very special participants, uh, survivor of a Holocaust, uh, Anastasia Gulay. Uh, Professor Plochi, who is a great uh, Ukrainian historian, and he knows uh, not only everything about the history of, of Russia, Ukraine, but I hope that he has also some good forecasts for, for, for the future. And uh, we have two young uh, and very talented uh, Ukrainian artists. Uh, we met them before during the press conference, but I think now we have a chance to continue uh, our conversation a little bit on a different, different uh, level. Well, I tell you, everything what happened 24th of uh, February, it means beginning of uh, Russian invasion, Russian aggression against Ukraine, the war, not a special military operation, how Putin is calling it, that, that is a real war. And th that is something what changed everything, not only the relations between Russia and Ukraine, but in fact the world. Uh, and I'm absolutely aware that this 24th of February will be in the history of mankind because it was such a uh, decision, it was such aggression, and it was an uh, uh, idea to destroy all the values, all the ideas which we share more or less after Second, Second uh, World War. Defending freedom, I think, that is a task for Ukraine now. And they are doing this uh, fantastic. Because, frankly speaking, me personally, I didn't expect that the uh, Ukrainian army will be so effective, so good. 
I didn't expect that unity of Ukrainian nation will be so strong. Of course, I didn't expect as well that uh, the reaction on the West will be so united. Could be more, but still is very united and is quite, quite effective. So the situation is uh, Ukraine is defending own freedom. But it's necessary to understand they are fighting not only for their freedom. They are not um, fighting only for own um, uh, peace for, for, for themselves. They are fighting on behalf of all of us. And even I tell you more, they are losing own life instead of us. Because this war is between democracy and autocracy. That is the war between our values and the values which are against freedom in very wide sense, against the freedom of life, against the freedom of politics, against the freedom of speeches, against the freedom of art and creation and everything. That is a serious war. That is probably the war of the 21st century. And in this situation, we have two sides. And it's necessary to understand who is right and who is wrong. And we are right, because we want to, to fight, to defend our values, freedom, democracy, etc. Putin is wrong, because he wants to occupy Ukraine. He wants to uh, uh, even, uh, let's say, uh, kill the, the Ukrainian nation, you know, what, what, what probably he said once or twice, but he, he has, he's doing all the things every day. This extermination of Ukrainian nation is a fact. It's a not a theory. This is not a political slogan. What we see now in Mariupol, what we've seen in Bucha, what we've seen in other places, that is extermination. That is genocide. That is something what is necessary to say properly. That is genocide, again, in, 20, 20, in 21st century. So, I think this war is is not one-off wars. That is really crucial war about the future of the world. And it's very good that we are here in Venice during this Biennale, which is a traditional event, but we can speak about this and we can alarm the people in the world, also by artists, also by um, arts, that that is a time to say where we are, on which side we are, on the side of democracy or autocracy. Or we want to see some compromises, partly democracy, partly autocracy. But I tell you what is famous sentence in many languages, it's impossible to be partly pregnant. No, it's impossible. We have to be on one side, fully, 100%. And even more, during this war, I think we have to be on this side of democracy, our values of, of freedom, uh, in 200 percent and that is my short introduction and I will tr start to ask firstly uh, you Anastasia you are a very special person because you survived Holocaust after Holocaust in Ukraine you were very active to share your experience and to convey this most important sentence never again never again and 2022 it happened You've seen this attack against um, uh, Ukraine. Uh, you and your family fled from Ukraine. Tell me, what, what why, why it happened and how, what, what we can do, what we should do. I, I count on, on your experience very much because uh, that, that's, that is unbelievable that, that this history can be repeated again in such Dramatic four. Please tell us. Я згадую своє життя, і мені не віриться, що це я його прожила. Це якийсь страшний сон. Я пригадую саме такі жахливі події в своєму житті, як голодомор в 32-му, 33-му році. 
uh, okay, uh, I'm remembering uh, my life and I'm understanding that uh, I live my life and I can't believe that this is actually true, that it wasn't like some kind of uh, very, very bad yeah, nightmare because I survived uh, Holotomor and this uh, happening again. Repressive. Яких відбувалися днем і ночю, яких із страхом ми чекали ночі, прийдуть батька заберуть, так як забрали директора школи, де я вчилася серед білодня, приїхали в синіх шнелях, забрали з урока і ніхто не відомо куди, десь у биковні, мабуть, розстріляли. Uh, repressions which were happening uh, during the day and during the night uh, when we were leaving and always we were afraid that someone will come and take us dead, for example, as it happened to one of the directors of the school. Приїхали за батьком, заберуть батька. And, and we were always preparing uh, some kind of backpacks with everything that he might need in case if someone will take him, and we were always super afraid that someone will come. І так, як пережили вже й цей страх, трошки успокоїлися, і раптом війна 22 червня 1941 року. We lived through this uh, fear, and then um, uh, the war happened on the, the 22nd of uh, June, Second World War. Дуже тяжко довелося нам це воєнне время. It was very hard for us to live through this uh, war time. Into, uh, Дуже багато військовополонених загинуло. Їх умер умертвили просто голодом. На всяких тяжких стройках між між іншими освінцем краматорії будували військовополонені польські і українські. І там, як розказували мені дівчата із освінцема, ті, що раніше мене попали туди. Я в 43-му році попала. Були дівчата ще з 42-го року. І вони пам'ятають, як будували ці краматорії спешно, срочно. І до того гинуло цих людей на стройки, їх не хоронили, їх не спалювали, прикидали сміття строїтельним. І після того, вже як пройшло багато часу, там не можна було ходити, як ступить людина. На землю виступає жижа із тіла розтвореного оцих людей, що погибли. Uh, so many prisoners of the war were killed and uh, uh, one of uh, my friends who uh, were in Asvensim since uh, 1942 because I appeared to be there in 1943 but before so many people were, were dying during building crematoriums and they weren't even uh, putting them in graves they were just uh, putting some kind of uh, trash on these dead bodies and you couldn't actually walk because when you were walking some kind of weird liquids like of death person was uh, soaking outside of the, of the earth. І це називають історією, я не назву це історію. Це наш вчорашній день. Історія – це Одисей, це Троянська війна, то історія. А це напротязі життя однієї людини. Отакі події відбувалися, це... And some people call this uh, uh, history, but it's not history. Uh, ancient Greek history, Trojan War is history, Odyssey is history, but this is not history. This happened basically yesterday because people, uh, human being, could uh, can live, survive uh, through both of this. You can see it yesterday. Не хочу вас утомляти своїми спогадами. Я тільки скажу, що ми у смертельному концлагері, куди нас із Освенцима перевезли, щоб не було свідків. 
не було свідків людей, хто бачив, як гнали євреїв потоками, як гладяв краматорію і під музику їх підманювали вас на переселення, вас на переселення. І люди йшли покорно тучами, по п'ятьоркам, маса людей із дітками. І вони не знали, що через 200 метрів краматорія, їм там дадуть чи ад, і спалять, і з їх ночі піде полум'я і дим, і всі не зловоння от месець. Uh, I don't want to bore you too much with uh, these uh, uh, stories about death people, but I just want to tell you that when I appeared to be in the death uh, concentrational camp after Aspensum, uh, there were so many people who were coming, uh, uh, who were uh, bringing us uh, to the crematoriums, and uh, people were saying that uh, uh, we, they will actually send us somewhere and we will just uh, be transmitted somewhere in another area, but uh, people were dying in these crematoriums. У всіх не встигли спалити, хто був у Освенцівлі, а їх треба було уністожити, щоб не було свідків. Їх завезли в смертельний концтабір Бергенбезен. І там почалася друга епопея. Uh, the, another uh, story happened in another death uh, concentrational uh, camp, uh, uh, which uh, uh, they were bringing us there, so no evidence uh, would be seen of uh, this mass uh, deaths that happened there. But uh, they couldn't kill everyone. Chief, голод, колючим проволокою забиті вікна, двері без виходу. Становище під бараком куча трупів, люди мруть, але нари не пустують. Кожного дня до останнього дня привозили із других тюрм, із других концтаборів людей сюди, щоб їх тут знищити. Uh, in, and even uh, uh, after death of some of the prisoners of war, uh, these uh, uh, jails never was empty because every time new and new people, new victims were coming, new prisoners were coming each day. Там було всі національності, найбільше із радянської сторони, російських, українців, білорусів, дуже багато поляків було. Були Йогославки, були євреї, ніхто націй не там не розлічав. Ми старалися допомогти якось один другому, допомогти оцей, пересили цей голод, це знущання, ці тіфи, ці жовтухи. Ми, на що ми надіялися, я не знаю, на що ми надіялися, що ми такі... І поляки говорили, зачекайте, наші прийдуть. А ми, ми так сміяли, звідки ваші прийдуть, і задлі ваші прийдуть. От, і так зиме ще й сперечалися. І то, да. Кстати, історія дуже важна, але скажімо, а чому це повторюється? Ми пережили ще в чині. Ніхто не думав, що колись щось іще в житті може таке трапитися. Ми з дівчатами от зустрічалися після звільнення і говорили, ми вже в себе стільки вбрали оцих, усяких поневіряння, оцього знущання, оцього катування. Уже бацили, ми всі в себе вбрали, не залишилося на світі такої бацили. Uh, why is it happening again? Uh, nobody knows. I, actually, all of us thought that nothing like that would happen, but it's still happening. Uh, difference, I think, um, of course, we can speak about this past uh, a lot, but uh, today, in these days, we have a discussion, is Putin making uh, war crime or, or not. 
And we have a lot of evidence that that is a real uh, war crime. But one of the next arguments uh, for this very legitimate accusations against Putin is that this generation, Generation Anastasia, they survived after Holocaust, they survived after World War II, and it was almost unimaginable that they will be, this generation will be confronted with this new war, with this new genocide, with this new butcher, etc. And that is something what is really, again, war crime. It's something what we have to call as a war crime against this generation, generation of survivors. And they ask you to applaud Anastasia for her life, for her fight. <laughs> and I guess now is a good bridge to go to young generation, the youngest generation among us. Uh, uh, the young artist from, from Ukraine. We heard what you said uh, during press conference. Tell us freedom. I understand that defending of freedom is quite obvious for you now. But tell us uh, what is the next? How we can fight more? Uh, not only in the sense of your job, your art, but what do you expect from, from, from us, from, from the West, from the people yeah, in, in, in Europe, from, from the participants of this, the, of this audience, yeah, because uh, this is our common, common uh, responsibility. This is our common, common fight. Yeah, tell us, from your very, very much Ukrainian perspective, from your artistic perspective, what, what do you expect? Uh, I'm, uh, thank you for the question, and I'm very deeply impressed by the words of Anastasia and um, by what you were saying. And I, I have some, just some comments, first of all. Uh, first, you were speaking about war crimes in Ukraine and about genocide. It's important to name everything, to bring real names to what is happening in Ukraine. In the international court, it is very important to bring a responsible into the court and start a legal procedure that will help us um, just uh, to bring some justice in the whole world, not only in Ukraine. And I think we must speak not only about war crimes, crimes inside of the war, but a crime of starting an aggressive war. This is the most important and, and the most visible crime itself that should be punished and should be discussed. Because war crime can happen only if aggressive war has started. And starting an aggressive war, starting aggression is the biggest crime. It is um, what I think, and I think it's important to speak about it internationally and to punish responsible. And uh, also uh, what Anastasia was saying um, reflected deeply in my memories and um, about um, recent events in Ukraine. When I was writing my diary, I was not only uh, writing about what was happening in Kyiv, but also studying events um, in other cities of Ukraine. And once I was speaking with uh, a, a lady, and I am describing it, that was working in a zoo in Kharkiv, in a, under constant um, under constant threat of life, and uh, she described me in an incredible case uh, that was very close to what Anastasia was telling when she and several workers of the zoo went uh, an incredible hard a long way to feed uh, hungry animals who were dying. And when they were coming closer to the zoo, Russians saw civil cards and started shooting. And these people, like in hypnotized, incredibly afraid state of mind, they took some of the food and went through some of the cages just to give something to animals who were dying and also dying because of Russian shootings, like dead, half-dead, hungry animals, and they were trying to help them. And when they came back, they all suddenly discovered that some people 
they, they were bringing to the zoo like a driver and another caring person, they died and they were carrying back to Kharkiv because this is a huge zoo near the Kharkiv city on the, like in, in wide, far away districts of Kharkiv city. They were bringing to Kharkiv not only the rest of the food, but also two bodies of, of people who tried to support animals even under the threat of death, under the threat of, of this kind of war. And I think that there is a lot of hope in this care, in this idea that we will support somebody in need, even so there is such a danger for our life. And Anastasia was also describing the situation in concentration camp, where people were actually condemned to death, but they were fighting, supporting each other, and even giving each other hope, saying, yes, somebody will come and this awful situation will end. And I think now we are in the middle of something that is still happening. It is absurd we are sitting here, but Russia is still um, killing just people who are living in Ukraine. They, they are killing just citizens and people who are in some districts of Ukraine sitting drinking tea and, or, 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 or sitting in, in the bomb, sh bomb shelters and there are bombs f falling on the houses and people cannot go just leave this bomb sh shelter. There are lo lots of cases like in Borodyanka. Um, such cases. We are sitting here in this moment uh, and, and speaking about something that is happening, but we have to fight power, really, to fight back and to stop this violence. And I am really thinking that Europe and other and, and countries that are uh, that that wants different reality, not authoritarian reality, they should take action on on all levels, and the first level today is a military level. It's, it's my artistic um, uh, thought, but, but there are all other levels also, and all Thank of you. them are important. Thank you. Thank you. So, do you understand the message? Military support first, but your solidarity is extremely important as well. So, we cannot uh, be tired after 57 days of the war because the war, this war can be continued. We have to be solidar with Ukraine for next months and, and years, also after the war. Mikita, tell me about, because you are representative of young generation, how much this young generation is determined? Is, uh, because you know one of the main arguments of um, uh, Putin is that Ukrainian, Ukraine is not a state, Ukrainians are, are not a nation. Tell us something about Ukrainian identity among young generation. How much you feel, not only Ukrainian, what is obvious, but how much you are, your generation is ready to fight, is ready to continue this fight, is ready to, to pay such extremely high, high, high price. Thank you. Uh, first of all, there is a big diversity inside of contemporary Ukrainian society and inside of its younger generation, uh, between of Ukrainian youth, there is a big variety of identities in Ukraine. And uh, it's not this, uh, you know, traditional conservative uh, nationalist vision of homogeneous nation, like, uh, you know, this whole body which is opposing other national bodies. No, we are dynamic constellation of identities of very, very different people. And uh, actually, our fight is anti-fascist fight. Russian Federation turned to a real fascist state. I use this term not as like political pejorative, like a name for some pure evil. No, I would like to use it in uh, more, you know, academic terms of political theory. Uh, really, it was this kleptocratic, autocratic, post-socialist, like uh, one of these uh, regimes 
whose ideology is just to keep themselves at power as long as possible. It was. But now it turned to real new fascism. And Russian ideological discourse uh, uses a uh, thing we call biologization of politics. Russian discourse describes Ukrainians as infected part of this big Russian body. Infected maybe by some Western, liberal, democratic, anti-traditional, anti-conservative values. And uh, then they do certain purification. They cut out this infected part. They erase Ukrainians and Ukraine. They want to transform us again to what is called Malorossia, like smaller Russia, like a younger sister. And uh, again, uh, their idea to erase us as Ukrainians. And uh, when they don't succeed, they erase us as human beings. So our fight is for our survival and for our right to be diverse. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, on the end of, because the opening ceremony is coming, so we have time for Professor Cyril Plochy, what I mentioned before. Uh, great historian, the man who knows everything about the past, and I think he's very good also to forecast the future. And uh, my question to you, I ask you for some very short, because we have not enough space for that, some lecture, to say to this audience first, why Ukrainians are the nation, why Ukraine is the state, and Putin is absolutely wrong. And uh, it's true that this war, this uh, uh, unbelievable resistance of Ukraine's, uh, of Ukrainians against Russia, that is beginning of new Ukraine. That is something what is really the act of uh, uh, foundation of, of the new Ukraine in sense of, of, of the state, in sense of the nation, in sense of the position in the world. Yes, uh, well, thank you, thank you for this question. Um, well, uh, Russian aggression came to Ukraine with the idea of nation that was coming from the 19th century. Which means if you speak Russian, you are supposed to be Russian. If you are supposed to be Russian, your loyalty was to mother Russia. And uh, Ukraine survived back in 2014, 2015 and showed the ability to resist today beyond anybody's imagination because it united itself across the linguistic, religious, and ethnic lines. This is the example of the civic nation that you can normally read about only in the political science textbooks, but not see in real life. Now you can see that on your TVs, now you can see it when you cross the border of Ukraine. This is the nation, this is the modern nation, the nation of 21st century, which is, as we can see now, undefeatable. And uh, one more thing, we, we didn't know whether that nation was there really until very recently, until February 24th, because the test of everything is in, in action. And no one can doubt that existence of that nation, the resilience of that nation today, and that's, that's something that points not only to our today or for tomorrow or day after tomorrow. This is the kind of the society, this is the kind of a nation that will, will exist for long, long, long time. And I'm very worried about Ukraine. I'm very worried about Ukrainians today. The crime, war crimes and other crimes indeed keep, keep going as we speak today. I'm worried about, about tomorrow, but I'm, I can't be more optimistic. I can't be more bullish about Ukraine and Ukrainians in the future. 
Uh, and uh, given that uh, I'm the only person now standing between you and, and the, the, that fantastic art that has been collected here, uh, I just want to point to one particular piece that is at the beginning that really I, I, I didn't expect to see it here. It's, it, it is very much what Ukraine historically is about and Ukraine today is about. It's an, a piece of religious art which is a mixture of the Western painting and an icon coming from the late 17th century. It's the, the model of it, it's Mater de la Misericordia, but it is treated in Ukraine as the uh, orthodox icon of the uh, Pokrov, of Pokrova, of the protection of the Mother of God, where under the protection of Mother of God is a Polish king, Jan Sobeski, <laughs> and, and there is the orthodox of the Uniate clergy, and the people are there, and they're all under protection of Mother of God, in, in the world where East and West comes together, and where these people need this protection for, defend, for defending their identity, their very unique identity. And this comes from the end of the 17th century, after 40 years of wars. And uh, I just couldn't think that his, a lot of things change in, 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 in the world in general. But that, that probably we couldn't look for a better beginning, for a better start chronologically of, of this, this exhibition that, that is here. And of course, the, the real highlight is the work of people with whom I'm really honored to be here. Thank, thank you, thank you. Uh, and may I add or ask you additionally, okay, but you see the situation, and I think many people here in this hall and in, in the world, in Europe, they try to understand what, what can happen. Because we have no doubts that uh, Ukrainians are strong, they are fighting uh, quite effectively. Uh, but the question, such difficult political question, the, is possible to, to look about some kind of peace agreement with this with this such man as Putin, the man who is a pathological liar and aggressor, or, or not? Because that, that, that is very important. In this country, I know Italy quite well, I know a lot of politicians in this country, still is some temptation to see that one day Putin will be, can be the partner for some peace agreement, something like that. What, what is your opinion? Uh, well, I mm, just read recently uh, the words of uh, my former student, who is now mayor of Dnipro, Boris Filatov. Yeah. Yeah. So he, and, and, and he said something really very important. He said that uh, we know very well where Putin will stop. He will stop where we will be able to stop him. And that is, that is the, 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 the essence of the war, and this is also the essence of whatever peace will come uh, there, because you can't base the, the peace, especially lasting peace, on, uh, on really the, the, um, any kind of promises or assurances made by, by really a war criminal today. But uh, we need a ceasefire. We need a ceasefire, and uh, we, need, we need a plan for the future. And uh, I have no doubt that, again, Ukraine succeeds as, as a nation, succeeds as, as a state, but it needs, it, it needs help, it needs assistance. Because uh, we just can't look into the future and make predictions and expect those predictions to come true without doing anything about that. And uh, Ukraine is on the front line of defending really basic principles of freedom. It, it sounds maybe banal, it sounds cliche, but that's what it is about. That's what people are risking their lives for. That, that's what they are dying for. The way of life, the way of life where you can choose your mayor, where, where, when your mayor can be kidnapped or can be arrested, when your president, when your leader doesn't leave the country, uh, when you have the right to choose, that's, that's uh, very much 
base of Ukrainian belief today, or, or system of beliefs, but it is also the basis of the system of beliefs of a broader world. And that system has, has to be protected. It is very fragile. It has to be protected. And uh, whatever future we think about, how, no matter how optimistic we are, it will not happen without us really pulling our resources, our will together, and, and uh, our action together. Yeah, I agree, and uh, that is the end of our panel. And uh, our message to you is to understand what the professor said on the end, and Anastasia said um, at the beginning, that is not the war between Russia and Ukraine only. That is the war about our values, about our principles, about our future. And because that is such war, we cannot be absent. We, we should participate. Of course, the forms are very, very differentiated. Um, humanitarian support uh, for the government, that is military support, political support. But in this war, we cannot be on the both sides. This war is to ask us where we are. And I think this Biennale in Venice and your presence here, that is a very strong sign. We are on the side of our values, democracy, freedom. We are on the side of Ukraine. We are on the side of justice. We are on the side of the better future of the world. And I think that was the main message of our panelists tonight. And I thank you for your patience, uh, for your attention, and please fight. Ukraine cannot be alone. We have to be with Ukraine together, concretely, practically, and I ask you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.